For Albert, the code is on Google Classroom. So if you go to your Google Classroom, and it says, have you accepted the invite for Albert yet? And right there is your class code. I put it in the comments so that it will alert you. I've said several times already, you need to set alerts for Google Classroom because if you log on, even if you log on once a day, the stream just keeps going down. So if I post something in the morning, and then I post two more things throughout the day, that morning post slides down and you don't see it when you first open up. So I strongly encourage you, yet again, to get some kind of notification for Google Classroom. Whether it's on your email, so that you can open up your email, you can see every time it alerts you, that's what I do. Instead of Google Classroom ringing on my phone, which it does not, it rings on my email. So then when I open my email, each one of your comments is a different email because that's the only way I can keep up with all the questions on Google Classroom. I didn't post the videos from last week only because there were kind of, there were some things that got cut off and I'm gonna repeat it today in class. So after today's class, hopefully the whole video records and I can post the whole thing. Clearly my computer is not gonna to connect to the internet. I think I have the thing up already though. Nope, I only have one of them up. I can at least review some of the homework though. All right, so we did our project review already, right? Okay, I'm gonna just assume we did. Again, so if nobody responds when I ask a question like that, I'm gonna just assume the answer is yes and I'm gonna keep moving, okay? Questions on your project from when we went over it last week? No, everybody kinda understood? All right, so I'm gonna quickly go through um, the previous homework. This was on evaluating functions. I did this one on Google Meets. Four plus a negative six just gives you a negative two. However, you cannot just write your answer as negative two. You have to make sure that you use function notation, okay? You can do all three of them, write one after another. You can also write it all straight across. So you can do f of 10 is equal to four plus 10 is equal to 14. And this way, you don't need to rewrite the function. It only works if there's one step, okay? Those of you texting on your cell phone, put them away. For problem like B, there are multiple steps. So what would I do here? What would I do for this problem? Yep, multiply negative five and negative nine. positive 45, and then my function is 48, okay? So there's multiple steps. 
Questions on how evaluating works for these two problems. Hopefully it's starting to like ring a bell and make more sense. Again, if you were having trouble with this, this would be your time to take notes. Cell phones, put them away. Please put them away. Because the result of that is me completely ignoring you when you email me because that's how, you, that's how I feel right now. Put your cell phones away. You don't want me to ever do that, and I won't, so please don't use your cell phone in class. So, my g function has an x, I mean, an h squared, okay, it has an exponent. This is also where the parentheses come in handy, because if you were to put that in your calculator without the parentheses, calculators are dumb machines. It's definitely going to give you the wrong answer, okay? So make sure you use your parentheses even when you're using your calculator. Your calculator would do 4 times 4, which is 16, and then it would carry the negative. That would be incorrect. Negative 4 times negative 4 would be a positive 16. Then negative 3 times negative 4 is a positive 12 plus 5. And now you just combine like that. So, I'm going to do one more of these. P of 6. Take a minute. What would I do? Yes. 6 squared, which is? 36. And then I would simplify. Okay, so minus 18 would give me 26. 18 plus 22. Question. Okay. The last one is a fraction that we love so much. Right? Yes? Okay. We're going to briefly talk about the importance of fractions compared to decimals in a few minutes. Yes? If you need to. So if you don't understand this, and you're like, Miss, I did this in a long time, I don't really get this, then you should be doing this. You should be writing it down. However, this is still math class. So if I'm doing this, and then I give you a quiz on evaluating, which I'm going to put up today, right? So when I give you that quiz on evaluating, it's going to be based on right or wrong answers because that's what it is. Your question should have came from here and you should be writing it down. Again, you can use your notes because everything's internet based now. All right. So, fraction. Again, I'm going to do the one I did when we did Google Meets. You guys need a minute to take your stuff off.
negative 3 over 4 times negative 16 plus 5. Fractions, they mean division. So this is simply negative 3 divided by 4 times negative 16 plus 5. However, with multiplication and division, right, we can just cancel out whatever comes the simplest. Hopefully we understand, right, that multiplying negative 16 times negative 3 is making a number bigger, which we don't want to do. So we're going to make it smaller by dividing first. Right? So if I take negative 16 and I divide it by my 4 first, um, are you just coming to school? Tell me first thing. Tyrus. Say it again. Tyrus. So negative 16 divided by 4 is what? Negative 4. Negative 4 times negative 3 because we didn't do anything to it. Plus 5. Questions on that part? Sure? Okay. So then hopefully from here it's a little bit simpler. So then this becomes a positive 12 plus 5, which is 17. So the next one. Negative 4 equals negative 3 over 4D plus 5. I didn't mean to put D. So now we're going to simplify this negative 4 divided by 4, which is what? Negative 4 divided by 4 is what? Negative 1, so I have negative 3 times negative 1 plus 5. Negative times a negative makes that positive, so positive 3 plus 5 is 8. Okay, so that's evaluating functions. You need to know how to do that because we're going to move on to function operations. And so evaluating functions needs to be the easier part when we get to the complicated stuff. Questions on those? That is a pen and
All right, anybody still copying this? Ready? You go. Okay. So, scrolling down, we went over this graph on Google Meet, but again, your job is to make sure you label everything, label everything, give it a title, make sure all your points fit on the graph, okay? If you start plotting points and you can't fit them, so you make extra lines, that's an incorrect graph. You want to make sure your data always fits on the graph provided. So then you got to change and manipulate your numbers if it doesn't fit. Okay, so domain and range, also what we went over on me. Linear functions. So just a key to every linear functions. Okay. So linear means it's a straight line. Key fact, you need to make sure that you know. Right? Linear means it's always going to be a straight line. This is mx plus b form. Hopefully we remember that from algebra 1. The domain is always, always, always going to be all real numbers. Written in set notation as negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay? So it's written either way. You do need to understand both. We'll get more to set notation down the line, okay? The range is also always, always, always gonna be all real numbers. And again, set notation is negative infinity and positive infinity. If I don't specify which way to write it, you can write it either way, okay? Please make sure you understand what that means though, okay? That means all the x values that you can ever have on the graph will be a part of this function. <clears throat> all the y values you can ever have on the graph will be a part of this function. This function stretches always on the x-axis and always on the y-axis. Quadratics are a little bit different. What do, does anybody know what quadratics look like, the shape of them? No? Isn't it like a V? It's a, it's a U, yep. So it's always a U shape. Yep, it's always a U shape. Whether it's up or it's down, it's always a U shape. And the domain, again, it's whatever numbers you can put into that value. You can put any number in for x. All real numbers again for the domain, always. 
right? These don't apply to a lot of graphs, but all linears will be this way, and all quadratics for the domain, it's going to be all row numbers. However, it's a little different for the range. Because the U starts at some point and goes completely up or down, right? There's a part of the y-axis that it doesn't go on. So I'm going to draw you a bigger picture. If this is my quadratic, right, it includes all of these y-values. But it does not include any of these. It doesn't touch down here. Does that make sense? Right? Again, if I have one that was upside down, it's going to include all of the y-values here, but it won't include any of these. So for a quadratic, there's always going to be an x is greater than or an x is less than, depending on what this point is. I think for this graph, it was 3, right? Written in function notation, it means it's going to start at 3 and it's going to go all the way positive. So x is greater than 3, or x goes from 3 to positive infinity. If it was less than, so this is less than, because those are the only two options for your range. If it was less than, it would go from negative to infinity to some number. Okay, so this is just for your notes. That's how the domain works in numerical form. Now, when you write it for like your project, you have to understand what these number means. I think it's ice cream sales to the ice cream sales. So this would mean my ice cream sales was three dollars or more, right? If I told you to write a real life function, if that was the number, that's what it would be. This would be like my ice cream can be as many as it want. It will never be this for something like ice cream because you can't have negative dollars. Does this make sense? A little bit. I know domain, we're used to just saying domain is x and domain is y, but they actually have to have values. We're not going to worry about the radicals because we just didn't get to radicals. We were going to do it before we went to distant learning. I didn't want to do it on the computer. It's really hard to do on the computer. Really hard. We're good? Okay. Anybody still writing? I'm also going to post a video if you need to stop it, slow it down, and go back to it. Well, when we get some internet, I'm going to post it. If not, I have to wait till I get home. Good. I'm going to remind you one more time because no one's asking questions, and I feel like people were very confused last week. Ask your questions, okay? Domain and range from a table, remember they're going to be distinctive. If it's a table, it's never going to be all real numbers, ever, okay? It's never going to be all real numbers from a table. And most likely, it's not going to go from one number to another. So I know you were taught things like, for this last one, my domain would be from 0 to 12. That's incorrect, because it doesn't cover all the numbers. If it did all the numbers from 0 to 12, you can say that. But on a table, it's going to be distinctive, which means it's, my domain is 0, 3, 6, 9, 12, not 0 to 12. Okay? So make sure you fully understand that. We're going to also always have stuff with some words. That confuses us when there's not numbers. And simply, just like we did on Google Meet, we're just going to list them. Probably they're supposed to be in alphabetical order. I did not mind that because I know this is the first time we've seen them with words, so I accepted your answers like that. But preferably, this would be in alphabetical order. These would go in order of the calendar. Your numbers are going to go in, in order, okay? Everything goes in order, even if it doesn't show up in order. I mean, they are in order, so it doesn't matter. Questions on that? Moving along. 
All right, so this is the next page in your packet. We didn't do this page, right? Okay, so this is the next page in your packet. We're gonna do it together, but it's more practice for the project that I posted, okay? So, the table below shows the diameter and circumference of five circles. It says, represent the data in order of pairs. Just because I wanna move the screen and keep them up, I'm gonna write it over here, okay? So my order of pairs, would simply be this is my x and this is my y value. So it'd be two comma two pi. Three comma three pi. Hopefully we understand how this works. Anybody not understand those order pairs? Okay. So next it says, graph my order pairs listed above, label the scale and axes. Okay, so again, always label. I need from two to six. However, I can't start at two because you have to count. If you start at two, you gotta go two, four, six, eight. And that's unnecessary for this. So just do one, two, three, four, five, six. And again, I'm now counting by pi. So, this is zero. One pi, two pi, three pi. And then I plot my points. Question. of the function. Tell me some things that you know about this function. What is some verbal description of this function? Yes. Say it one more time. It keeps going up. So what is that mathematical word for going up? Increasing. Increasing. So if you're writing something for me, you can say going up. Oh, I'm going to give you an extra point for using the math word. What else? The line is linear. It is linear. It is linear. So we're also going to learn that if it's a line, it is linear. If it's not linear, then it's not called a line. It's called a curve. We'll get there. Though. So yes, it's linear. It means it goes up on a consistent basis. What else? All right, some key things. When you describe a graph, you want to try best to describe it by the data and not the picture. So saying the line is linear is describing the picture. Saying the data of uh, this was diameter and circumference. Not diagram. Right? So saying that data from the diameter and circumference is increasing linear. Okay? So that's like a full sentence that gives me both of these things in written form, and now we're talking about the actual data. Okay? What was the last question? Oh, the patient. Something else that's important about this graph to notice, can my graph go on forever? Meaning, can it just keep going down like this, right? Or up like this. Is my graph continuous? Or does it have a distinctive start and stop point? Think about its diameter and circumference. Can it go on forever? Yeah? Well, can it be zero? Can my diameter and circumference be zero? If it is, what does that mean? What does it mean? Hmm? 
What does it mean if my diameter and circumference are zero? What is diameter measure? What is that diameter measure? Anybody know? What does it measure on? No one? No. What is circumference? No, we don't know what that is. We've never heard circumference before? Raise your hand if you've never heard circumference before. So raise your hand if you have heard circumference before. Okay, so what does that circumference relate to? A circle. A circle, thank you. So, can I have a circumference of zero on a circle? Can you measure zero on a circle? So all the way around is a measurement of zero. There's zero meters of circumference. What does that mean? No, what does that mean? That there's no circle, thank you. Right, so there's no circle. So it cannot be continuous. This graph cannot be continuous because you can never get zero measurement. You can't measure something to be zero meters or zero yards or whatever the circumference is. You also can't have negative, right? right? You're never gonna measure something and get a negative number. It's not gonna be negative inches. So it can't be continuous, okay? That's something important to notice with a graph. The last part is an equation. So in order to find an equation for a linear line, right, we need slope and y-intercept. Where would this line cross the y-axis? You can see that, right? Where does the line cross the y-axis? Here's my line, and here's the y-axis. What number value do they cross at? Zero. Zero. Now we need our slope, rise over run. How much did it go up? One what though? One what though? What is this counting by? I don't know You know what that's called? Sounds like, man, I really don't like y'all teachers. Nobody knows what this is called? Pi. Pi, yep. Yeah. So it's counting up by one pi, so the rise, it's okay will be one pi. And then how much does it run over? One. So this one and one simplify to just pi. Pi is a number. So my equation would be pi times x, because I don't need that zero. Okay? That would be my equation for this data. And again, I'm using data because it's not for the picture. That's not important. Pictures of graphs, like saying line, is only good for math class. In real life, no one cares about the picture, they care about the data. They wanna know how much money they're gonna make, they wanna know how they're gonna progress on their business, so they're talking about the data. Questions on this? Anything for life, miss? This is absolutely ridiculous. Okay, I asked, don't say I did not. Now, when you go to do your project, don't say, Miss, I don't even know how to start this. And be like, we did it, and you didn't have any questions. All right? Function junction. We got this? Everybody good? Still no internet. All right. Function junction. This whole next pages, the whole next pages are all questioning whether something is a function or not. Okay? So if I was to plot these points, and I'm not going to really plot the points only because of time. I don't want to have to do all of that. However, I'm going to, like, generally speaking, plot them. So this was 148, and we're going to guess that that's 48. And this is 2 and 61, 3 and 74, 4 and 87, and 5 and 100. And we're going to pretend that that is already accurate. Would this be a function? Just so we're clear, in case we didn't pay attention, I'm never going to give you the answer when I ask a question. I'll just sit down. So we need to participate. So you got a 50-50 chance. Is it a function? Yes. I got a yes and a no. Why or why not? Because it's consistent. 
because it's consistent. So that means it is a function or isn't a function? It means it is. It means it is. Any other reason? Or we were just guessing? Just guessing? Hmm? Okay, that's fine. I'm okay with guessing right now. I really am. So this is a function. One, yes, because it's consistent. But also because, does anybody remember the vertical line test? Right? So if I went through every point with a nice vertical line, it's only going to hit one point. How you tell from the table, every x value is unique, and it has its own y value. So yes, it's a function. The next one, a little bit different. So it goes up, okay. So 20 is 99, 30 is 99, 40 is 99. Is this a function? Hmm. No, wow. Yeah. They what? They don't have their own value. Okay. Other way to tell vertical line test. Did I touch more than one point? Did each vertical line touch more than one point? Nope. So is it a function? No. Yes. Oh. So, in order to find out it's a function, it only has to, oh no, I was so, I worded that so trick question, right? It means that it is a function if it only touches one point. So, each x value, right, only happens one time. So, it doesn't matter if they come out to the same result as long as they're each their own value, okay? So you can repeat that y, not for x. Okay. Now this is unique. I'm going to draw my vertical lines. Is this a function? No, why not? Because the y value is something. Are repeating? Did it pass the vertical line test? Does any vertical line touch more than one point? Nope. So yes, it passes the vertical line test. So this was the question, right? So the y's can repeat as long as, again, you have a difficult, unique x value. The x value is the one that's independent. As long as it has a different x value, And full clarity, this will be the last one. So we are going to point out, right, this is our concern. So let's see how that matches up. So 48 and 110, let's say it's somewhere over here. 54, 125. 62, 135. 62, 150. And 69 and 160. 
is this a function? No. Everybody should be saying no at this point, all right? Because this vertical line touches two points. So if you have the same x value, they must have the same y value. That's where it becomes a problem and not a function. So you can repeat x values, but they have to have the same result. You can repeat y values all you want. Doesn't really matter. But the x values cannot repeat with a different result, or it's not a function. Okay? So we're going to go quickly through the other ones. Investing money, they all have a unique x value, so it doesn't matter. This is just a function. So now just by looking at the graph by a vertical line test, is this a function? Yes. yes. Oh, that sounds like more understanding, right? Because it means that nothing, if I did vertical line test all across this, I'm never going to touch more than one point. So for something like this, you would make a table. However, what I've seen in the past right, is people trying to, so this graph only has three unique points. The rest of them are somewhere in between. Don't try to guess a point, it's never that serious, okay? Just use the three points even though the table gives you room for four. Seven, this a function? No, nope. If I did vertical lines, multiple of them are gonna hit multiple points. Not a function. Okay? Yes. yes, linear functions. They're called linear functions because they're functions. Okay? All straight lines are going to give you a function. Quadratic. Is this a function? Yes. Yes, because again, I do that vertical line test, it's going to give me a function. Okay? And this is a graph very similar to the one on your page before. My range would be from 3 and above. 3 and positive infinity. Is this a function? Yes. Yes? Yes. 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 Okay? If I did my vertical line test, I'm still only going to touch one point each. Okay? These two lines always confuse people. Is this a function? No, it's a vertical line. It means A touches every single point on that vertical line. Not a function. Okay? You can make an equation, which I think you did last year, hopefully, but it's not a function. Those are not the same. All right. Questions on functions and or domain? Yes? Um, do we have to um, copy our work down on the No. Whenever we're taking notes, I'm not going to ask you to send those to me. Okay? Nope. This is all just review and understanding. Sometimes I might ask you to do that, so let me correct that. Sometimes I might say, post your notes from today's thing, only when we're doing something brand new and I was expecting everybody to take notes. So when we get to stuff, like when we get to quadratics, no, you guys did not do quadratics in algebra one. Right? So when we get to quadratics, a lot of it, there's no way you could just memorize it. I'm not going to expect you to take notes. So I might go, hey, for extra credit today, everybody post their notes, and you'll get extra credit. That would be the only way I would require you to post your notes. Okay? And that would be random, like a pop quiz kind of thing. It would be random. It would be like if I seen a, if I seen a couple people who never take notes and they keep not taking notes, now I'm going to start giving extra credit for notes just really to push them to take notes. That's really what that would be for. But never as like a right or wrong answer for notes. Any other questions on functions and or domain or range? Evaluating functions? The Google quiz that I'm going to post is multiple choice. Okay, so you're going to get, you know, it's going to grade it itself. However, if you get, I don't know how many points it is, but if you get under 80%, I'm going to make you either do it over 
and or show me your notes. So when I post something on Google Classroom, right, for a quiz, it's really, the only way I can effectively do it is to make it a multiple choice. It's just how it works. The only other option is to give you an Albert quiz, and from the way Albert looked this weekend, that doesn't look like I'm giving you quizzes on that. People were like sending me screenshots, and I didn't even know what the question was asking for me to even give them help. So I don't know how far I'm gonna use Albert. I gotta look a little bit more into it. I think that that's a great program, it just might not be great for math. But I'll look further into it, we'll try it one more time. But if it goes the same way, I'm not gonna use it. It's on Google Classroom. It, on the question where it says, have you signed up for Albert? It's under there. There's a question on Google Classroom that you guys are supposed to answer. It says, have you signed up for Albert? So listen. Under that question is the class code. If you open that question up, the class code for Albert is right there. It says, have you signed up? And then right there is the question, is the code. You see it? For Google Classroom? Why aren't you on Google Classroom already? Oh, sweetie, I, you gotta be more. There's a code for Albert and there's a code for Google Classroom. You gotta be more, sorry, sweetie. And I have no internet to even see that you're new because, you know, we're awesome. I'm recording, so I might not, you know. Tell me your name again. All right, it's not gonna let me send you an invite. Um, let's see if I can just do the code. Hmm. This is so much fun. Are you ready? You don't have to do the past homework assignments, but there is a student survey all the way down at the bottom of class work mm -hmm. um, and parent survey. Do that when we get a minute. Mm -hmm. All right. The next thing we're going to be doing, oh, you know what? Before we do this, I do want to um, go over the, the fraction. All right, here's my turn. Right? So a lot of you don't like fractions. They're going to come up repeatedly. They're also going to come up in equations where you can't just put them in your calculator. Most people want to change them to decimals, right? How many of you just change fractions to decimals and use that? Right? So I'm going to show you the difference. If I had one third, what is that as a decimal? 0.33. And I'm going to show you how these things are not equal. So normally, when you do it, you just put it in your calculator. So anybody have their phone, you can take your phone out right now so you can use your calculator because I want you to see it yourself. Let's say we're going to do $20,000. No, I forgot. That wasn't a good one. Let's do $250. Let's do something like that. $240,000. Okay? So if we do $240,000, say we're buying a house for $240,000. A fraction means I divide this by three. So if I take 240,000 and I divide it by three, what do I get? Say it one more time. 80,000. If I take 240,000 and I multiply it by 0.33, what do I get? Seventy-nine. I didn't hear you. So what is the difference between the two? There we go. So if we did eighty thousand take away seventy-nine nine hundred and twenty. What's the difference? What? Eighty dollars. So, if someone said, right, I'm going to just give you 0.33, instead of I'm going to give you one third, would you be mad about that $80? Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. That $80, that's a lot of money. You just be handing somebody for no reason, right? So, 
be careful when we start talking about business and money.